In this exercise, we're going to build up our extruder assembly. To do this, we're going to want to start a brand new part. Go ahead and click save on this part and name this the extruder assembly. You need to save a part before you can bring other parts into it. Let's go ahead and turn on the origin so that we can see where we're at. In a previous lesson, you made the extruder mount frame. Go ahead and click on that part and drag it into this area over here on the right. And you will drop it in our environment just like so. Go ahead and click OK. Now at this point, this part is floating in space. You can actually click on it and drag it around. Now we don't actually want that to move around. We want it to be fixed in place. So to do this, come over to where we see browser, go down to the part, right click on this part and say ground. That'll create another little pin down here in our history to let us know that this part is now grounded. So when you click on this part, you cannot drag it around. Now beneath this video, there's going to be several files that you can download. Go ahead and download those now. Navigate your way into your purchase parts folder, and then at this point, click the upload button. You can drag and drop all of those files right here. So here we have it. We're going to drag these over there, and boom, these will upload. Now, I already have these parts, so I'm not going to click the upload button, but you would. Now at this point, we need to bring in more parts to build up our assembly. So let's start with the extruder. Find the file that says BMG style extruder, drag that into the assembly environment and drop it in place. We're not gonna worry about moving this part around right now. Let's just go ahead and click OK. Now to constrain this part into its location, what we're going to use is a thing called joints. That is found right up here or it's J on your keyboard. Now, if we take a look at the joint menu over here, there's many different ways to kind of select areas. We're gonna go through that in just a moment. And there's different motion types down here. For this first assembly, we're going to be using rigid, so we don't really need to change anything. Matter of fact, let's just go ahead and run through the process of doing this right now. The first thing I want to connect is going to be this extruder over here. So for component one, I'm going to go down here to select. So you can see there's this little icon that's following your mouse around. And when you get close to a certain spot, it'll kind of snap to location. What this is telling you is where it's going to try to connect the two parts together and the orientation that it's going to try to match. Rather than try to explain it, it's best to just see how it works. If I click this right here, you can see that that little circle, little half moon right there is going to look just like that. Then it's asking me for the next location. And I want it to be on this circle right here, but on the front face. So as I mouse over this, you can see that there's several different dots that line up. And if I hold control, I can actually keep that selection and then mouse around and select different areas here. So as you can see, I can go to this front face, I can go to the back face or the midpoint of this circle. What I really want to do is just come right over here to this circle right there and click on the edge. And just like that, you can see that the extruder is now lining up based on what those indicators were showing us and, that, and, and it's locking these two parts together. Now this is facing the wrong way, so I'm going to come over here to the menu and I'm going to hit the flip orientation. So that'll flip it uh, to the other direction and it's still a little bit off, so let's go ahead and come on over here. You can find this little wheel, and you can rotate this and rotate it 90 degrees down so that this is facing up and the handle is facing down. And that's the correct orientation for this extruder. Let's go ahead and click OK. So at this point, this is now locked in place and it can't move around. And because it's connected to the extruder mount frame, which is grounded, nothing can move. Let's bring in the next part. Find the file that says NEMA 17 stepper motor and then has this 17HS19 behind it. It's the big motor. Go ahead and drag that into the assembly like so. And what you can do is you can actually kind of move this thing around if you need to kind of get it to a, an easier spot to, to grab it. I kind of like to line it up in an orientation that's going to be relatively close to where I want it to be. That way when I'm scrubbing through the history, it's a little bit closer to where, where it's actually gonna go. In bigger assemblies, it can help you stay organized. But I'm just going to put it right down here and click OK. And then we're going to go back into the joint tool by pressing J. I'm going to come over here to the hub and click on the base of the hub. And then I'm going to click on the opposite side of the circle right here, so that edge right there. And the motor is now locked in this location. And as you can see, it's going inside of the extruder, which is perfect, exactly like we want it to happen. I'm going to go ahead and click OK. Next up, we're going to bring in some fasteners. The fasteners I want to bring in is going to be the SHCS, which stands for socket head cap screw, M5 by 14. Every time we have a spot where we're going to bring a fastener onto our aluminum profile, that's going to be the bolt that we use. So I'm going to take this and I'm going to drag it into the assembly, just like so. 
probably getting the idea that we kind of do the exact same thing over and over again. So I'm going to bring it in. I'm gonna go ahead and arrange this one just like so, just kind of makes things a little bit easier. Click OK, press J, jump into our joint tool. We're going to grab the base of this and go straight to that circle right there, locking it in place and click OK. Now there's many times we need to bring in lots of fasteners and rather than dragging each one out here and then putting it in place, there's a faster way to do this. What we can do is we can click over here on the left under the browser so that it's selected. We can hit the Control C key on our keyboard. So we're copying this. And then if we press Control V, we can paste another one down. And then at this point, we can see that we already have another part right here ready to go. Now there's one thing that Fusion 360 likes to teach a lot. And that is that when you're bringing in a part for the first time, you can actually locate it right where you want it to go. So you can see that we're, we brought this part in here. We're in this move copy command. If we click point to point, it gives you the original point that we want to go from. So that could be right here to a target point, which is going to be right up there. And you can see that this is actually going to move the part to that location. So you can bring a part in and locate it exactly where you want it to be. But here's the catch. That part is not locked in place. It's not grounded, nor is it connected to anything. So if I were to click on this part, I can actually move it around. And then you can see right up here, there's an option to capture a position or revert it back to its previous location. You'll notice whenever you click a part and drag it around, you're going to get this option. Let me show you what happens when you click capture position. You see down here under our history, we've now created another spot right here called position one. And if we roll this back just to its previous location, we'll see that the fastener moved back to its previous location as well. So while bringing a part in and moving it to its desired location is really handy, you can see that there's an advantage to using the joint in that it's actually connected to a part. However, if you don't have a clear way to make a joint, sometimes the move tool is your best option. So I'm going to go ahead and click on this position one, hit delete on that, I don't want it there. And what I'm actually going to do is go in here and add a joint to this. So clicking the joint tool, you can see that I'm going to go right in here. And then I will click on those two edges right there, locking it in place, and then clicking OK. So if all your parts are here and they're all connected by joints, then that completes the extruder assembly. One final thing that we should go ahead and do here is turn off the origin and joints if we're not going to use these down the road. That way we have a nice clean assembly and when we go to bring it into the next assembly above it, we don't reveal all that stuff in the next assembly. Fusion 360 works a little weird like that and all the stuff below it that's visible becomes visible in the next assembly above it. So things can get a little bit messy. And if you have something showing up that you don't want to see, this is a good spot to turn it off right there. Another option that you'll see me reference a whole lot here is object visibility and turning off all of this stuff here, which is a way to kind of hide that stuff if you don't want to go in there and edit it. Often you'll see that I will leave a lot of that stuff on while I'm developing a project and then I come back and clean it up at the end. So at this point, I'm happy with this assembly and I might wanna go ahead and start making it. To do that, I would need to convert this part into an STL and I'm going to share that with you in just a moment here. But since we are at the end of the lesson, I need to hit you with an upsell. So just in case you're wondering, there are more classes available at watchitprint.com where again, I cover this entire 3D printer project. However, that might be a bit much for you, but in case you're wondering, the actual files for this 3D printer are available there and that's also a great way to donate if you're looking to get a little something more and help support me in the process. So with that upsell out of the way, here's how I like to export parts as an STL. All right, so to export this as an STL, here's what I would like to do. I like to go into the assembly right under here. You can click right down on the browser and then you can find the bodies right inside of here. Depending on whatever component you're looking at, that's how you can get to it. And you can right click on that and say, save as STL. This is easily the fastest way to do this in my opinion, although there's many ways to get to the same spot here. Uh, the settings that I like to use here that control how dense the mesh is, which we can get real technical about. Actually, I just like to do this. I go to the refinement, I click on high, and then I go down to normal deviation, which is this box right here, and I hit three. And this has always worked for me. So then I go down here and I just click okay. And this is going to save it to something like my desktop. And then because I like to save different versions of my files, I'm going to call this a revision one or something like that, because you might have to go back and tweak things just to make them a little bit different. 
And this way I have a file trail that I can follow. So that ends up on my desktop. And then at this point, I'm going to jump into my favorite slicing software, which is Cura. And then once this is open, you can just take that file, drag it right in here, and there you have it. Boom, that part is ready to go. Now you might need to actually rotate this around and move it in order to get the print orientation correct. While this is possible to print like this, what I like to do is just kind of rotate this one so that it's facing down a bit like that. Then you can say, lay flat, and it figures it out. Click the slice button and you're ready to go. Now you have G-code, you can save it to a little file on an SD card or however you have it set up to get to your 3D printer. One thing I highly recommend, at least when you're going through my project here, is to print these parts out as you complete it because it's really awesome to kind of see the thing go from the screen to a real object in front of you. And it can serve as a great way to motivate you to keep moving on throughout the class to make the next part or to make your own things now that you know how to use the software. Another trick you can do is go to right down here and say application. And if you click this little button, you can navigate to where your slicing software is. In my case, it's Cure right here, and then click Open. So if your output is sent to your custom and you have that set up, then when I click this button, we're actually going to skip the part where we make the file and it'll jump straight into the slicing software. So just like that. Now, I don't like doing this because I like to create the file trail, but this is a way to skip a step. And just like that, you can see, we're right back in the software. One final way to do this is to actually go down to manufacturing and look into additive manufacturing in this workbench. However, it's still kind of a new thing and I still very much prefer working with Cura. However, that'll be a great lesson for another time. But as of now, you have completed this class and I hope you find it useful. Let me know down there in the comment section below what you've thought about it. And better yet, maybe go back to lesson one and let somebody new coming to this course know what to expect. Until next time, have a great day and I hope to see you again.